From Deep Within Our Hidden Volcano Laboratory, a podcast about gaming from the people who bring your games to life. These are your core elements. Core Elements, episode 55, recorded on December 12th, 2013. I am Wes Wilson, and once again, we do not have a Spencer with us. We were not able to have him join us today. However, we are joined by Steve Gaynor of Fulbright, uh, makers of Gone Home. Hey, how's it going, man? It is going great. I have tried to get you on the show for a long time, and you have been a very <laughs> busy, you've been a very busy man. It's, it's true, yeah. The game came out uh, maybe, what, four months ago now? Something like that. So stuff has finally uh, settled down enough that, uh, that, yeah, we could get together and chat. And how has the response on the game been? Like, I mean, I know y'all, you've gotten a lot of positive reviews, um, but do mm -hmm. you feel, like, how much of that do you feel was just joie de vivre about a cool indie title, you know, getting a lot of good press? And how much of that has lasted? How much of that do you feel is still holding on? Um, I, I, I mean, we're, we're really lucky to currently be in a bunch of like, you know, end of year list kind of stuff. Um, so I think that, you know, people are, are still thinking about the game, um, you know, months after it first came out. I mean, we, we definitely, we got a lot of attention that we were really hugely excited about, you know, at release and there were like tons of great, you know, like blog posts and, and other things that people wrote aside from just reviews. Um. But yeah, you know, we still we're still getting really really great, you know, just like emails from people that have that have just now played it and and want to share their experience with us and stuff. So um, no, it's it's good, and uh, we're glad that you know more people are going to be picking it up like for the holidays and everything. So how uh, how do you usually describe your game to other people? I when I try to, I mean, I usually go with you know, oh, it's kind of a cinematic experience. How, how do you describe the game style of it? Well, that's interesting. I mean, what do you think? Why is that what you jump to? Because in a lot of ways, I think that it's also the opposite of a cinematic experience. Well, I think that there's something about a structured narrative mm -hmm. that I think your game does manage to capture. It's not necessarily like... Um, it, it's not something as, as rudimentary as like Dear Esther where you're walking down rails, but at the same time, there is a general structure to the way yeah. the story is presented. And I feel like the gameplay elements are more immersive than active. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, yeah, there was, a, there was a tweet that we got not too long after the game came out that somebody said, I just finished Gone Home, and I don't know whether I watched a movie, read a book, or played a video game, and I <laughs> love it. <laughs> uh, and I'm like, that's great, you know, because, I mean, it is, like, there's a lot of reading, uh, but also it's 100%, you know, like, based on player interaction. There is no put down the controller and watch a cutscene or anything, but it, it still, I hope, does have kind of that, like you were saying, um, you know, crafted... Uh, narrative experience that feels cohesive that that I think um, is a feeling that's that's often associated with um, with a good movie you know um, but as far as just as far as how if someone asks what's your game about you know it's like well it's a it's a game about exploring this house to find out about the people that live there you know to, yeah. to discover the story of, of the, the family that lived in this this place and you know, it's 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 about that feeling of being in a house, you know, at night on your own. And it has that unsettling feeling that you're familiar with um, and just giving you as the player the ability to to you know explore and investigate this place to basically solve a, a mystery through this kind of active observation. Um, and then, of course, you know, that doesn't go into any of the specifics of like, oh, well, what kind of house is it? Who lives there? And everything. But that's. <laughs> Yeah, you know, that, no. that's what playing the game is about discovering, right? So, what was were you surprised by the response that you got with all the positive press? Did you did you predict you were going to get this? Um, you know, it's it's one of those things where like when we when we when we were done with the game, but before it came out, we at least were like, 
we think this game is good. You know, we like it. If we played this, we would like this game. And, you know, that's like, that's the best you can do before it's out in the public is just like, do, do, do I feel like this, this thing is good of, of my own standards? And we at least felt like we were, you know, proud of the work that we had done. But um, I would, I would definitely say that there's been a lot of, there, there, there are a lot of, of parts of the response that, yeah, we, we could not have predicted, you know, just like, being in the New York times and just like a lot of just the really personal emails people have, have sent us talking about like their connection to the game and saying like, thank you for making this game and stuff like that. It's, it's not anything that, that we pictured. We hoped that, you know, we felt like, okay, this is going to have its audience and there's going to be people that connect with this thing and like it. But it's, it's, I think reached a much broader kind of field of people than, than we could have, than we could have imagined, you know. Um, like they, there was there was one day when I where I was on Twitter and you know I saw Cliffy B and David Jaffe like having a Twitter exchange about playing the game, and you know that's not something that I was <laughs> that I was banking on before we released it. You know, just that kind yeah. of thing. But it's it's been cool to see the the um, the, the the kind of reach that it's had. Have you have you felt like you've gotten an accolade that you really like was too much? Is there anything you've gone? Oh wait, come on, come on now. That's <laughs> is there anybody who said anything that that made you go? No, wait a minute. It was a good game. It wasn't that good. Um, I, like I, I I think I mean some people in like some of the more like you know personal blog posts and stuff have like have expressed you know really really kind of emotional reaction to the game. And on the one hand, it's not something that I can picture from my own point of view, you know, from inside the, 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 the process of having built it. Um, it's like, wow, really? But on the other hand, it's like, I can't deny them the reaction they had to the thing, you know, if it was like yeah. really important to them or they, you know, just like, you know, cried their eyes out or something like that, that's, that's intense. Uh, but I also, you know, I, I, I can't, uh, I can't say like, oh, that's too much. You know, it's like, hey, if, that, if that's how you feel about the game, I'll, I, I, I can, you know, all I can do is say like, wow, that's incredible. <laughs> well, okay, we will we'll talk a little bit more about your game and your work in a bit. And uh, but first. Lab notes. So my gameplay again this week has been a little bit limited. I have mainly been focusing on a few things um, because of some other work that I'm doing. But uh, I did manage to finally pick up uh, the novelist uh, Kent mm. Hudson sent me a sent me a key to play the game, and I started cool. streaming it and recording it last night. And I will be posting a let's play of it on Wes Wilson on YouTube. And uh, it is it is. It, it reminds me a little bit of your game in that there is this, there is something going on and it's you exploring it and attempting to get to know the people and the environment and the gameplay elements create this immersive nature. But it's mm -hmm. funny because I, 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 I thought like one would think that certain narrative experiences would make for excellent streaming or let's playing. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think they like really narrative stories sometimes are robbed by that because it removes the immersion of the gameplay. And then also there are long periods of um, soliloquy or reading or, you know, whatever going on that I think detract from the whole streaming experience or let's play experience. And I, I can't 100% say that I think the let's play is going to be very entertaining, but I love the game. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's something that's been strange kind of to see for us as well. Because, yeah, like you were saying, you know, like these kinds of games, Gone Home included, a YouTube, you know, Let's Play is often like, okay, you walk five feet, you read something for 45 seconds, then you walk another feet and you're five feet and you read something else. You know, it's like that, yeah. that doesn't sound like riveting viewing. But yeah. also we've had a lot of people or some number of people, you know, like, right into us and be like, Oh man, I saw a, a YouTuber do a, a let's play of your whole game. And I, I watched it and it was so 
gripping and I cried at the end, you know, and it was amazing or whatever. And I'm like, if that if that's how people can experience these kinds of games now, like more power to yeah, them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but it, it does seem like a weird, like a weird thing, you know, weird yeah. phenomenon. Well, and I'm going to, I actually recorded my Let's Play of Gone Home, but I never released it uh, because I didn't really think it would work very well on the on the channel that I was working with at the time. Yeah. Um, and uh, my joy at the end of playing that game is visible. And I can imagine that, like, if you're if you're in with a YouTube Let's Player and you watch them play some of these emotionally binding games, that can be a real experience watching people you care about experiencing emotion during gameplay. Um, yeah, I'm sure you're right. And having their having their impressions and being filtered through like the experience they're having, not just yes. the actual content, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, another game I've been poking around with, I I I was using Smite as my go to um, I need to wake up game because I <laughs> yeah. uh, with with three kids um, gaming sometimes ends up being the time that I fall asleep at the keyboard and I need certain games. Right. If, if I'm going to motivate myself to be active in playing games at night, sometimes I have to pick something that will lift up my spirits and smite yeah, yeah. smite has been it, but I kind of put it down for a little while. I think I'm going to pick it back up again soon, but I decided to pick up my old go-to, which was orcs must die. Oh uh, yeah. And I picked up orcs must die too. And I am really amazed at how much fun that game still is it 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 made me laugh it made me have fun and i i still can't recommend that up i don't know if the humble bundle that has it on it is still active um but if you're listening and and can pick up works must die i i really can't tell you how much i enjoy that game and yeah, then it's really i mean i, I played it uh, i played the first one i didn't play the the second one yeah um but you know the, it, am, am i wrong the second one um is is also um i mean it's it's an extension of the first game right like it's the the first game and then there's more to it and it's, it's more complex and there's more playable characters and stuff yes like that, right? that is exactly um, the case yeah and I, I i thought it was a really interesting take on um basically tower defense but in in this action uh, yeah. kind of uh action oriented way of presenting it. well but they also really captured something in it and that is and it, it's that sadistic pleasure of a bumbling goofy orc trying to make it past you and you're flipping them around and throwing them onto spikes and having them wail and complain and gnash their teeth at their inability to get right. by and it it just uh, it just makes me laugh and brings me joy. Yeah. Uh, and then lastly, of course, I was poking around with Starbound. I posted a Let's Play of that online. Uh, you can go to uh, youtube.com slash Wes Wilson and watch that. I played with Bebop Vox, and I can't wait to pick it up again. Uh, but it's um, – because I, I didn't get into Terraria, but I've enjoyed the yeah. Starbound stuff so far, and I'm, I'm looking forward to poking around with that some more. Yeah, people have said that they're really similar. Is that – are they very – like – what is the biggest difference between Starbound and Terraria? Well, I, I think it's that you can travel from planet to planet. Um, mm, okay. And they're more difficult as you go on. Um, you start over a basic planet, and you can basically play Terraria on that planet. But then you can also beam back up to your ship, move to another planet, and do stuff there. Oh, okay. Interesting. So it's it, it's largely unchanged. unchanged. I didn't... I didn't play any Terraria. Um, one of the things that I do like about Starbound is that there feel there is a feeling of immensity. You can just be walking along, and then you can find like a whole city of people doing stuff. Yeah, huh. um, it's cool. it's it's pretty interesting. Uh, so, what have you been playing lately? Um, I have. I'm I'm part way through. Um, Legend of Zelda Link Between Worlds on 3DS, um, which uh, I I haven't been super into any of the Zeldas really since like Link to the Past. And then this is very much um, kind of a reimagining of Link to the Past. And I, I'm finding it interesting and I'm finding the way that they approach um the, the dungeons being laid out in such a way that you can do a bunch of them in like any order um, a really nice way of like trusting the player to be able to find stuff and and not just be led by the nose um, 
and you know it's got like just good good design sense to it um and good feel so i'm i'm glad to be back into that it's one of those games where you know a dungeon probably takes maybe like half an hour or 45 minutes or something to clear if you're trying to be thorough and so it's been the kind of thing where i can just kind of like get on my couch and pick it up and clear a dungeon and then put it back down and kind of do it uh in in chunks like that and it it feels good for that um so yeah i've I've been enjoying it it's weird i've never really been a handheld gamer and my son either really and 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 my son is turning six and so or has turned six and so we're getting close to the handheld time Mm -hmm. and i'm pondering whether i want to go ahead and like get a machine for myself and experience it because i mean there are all kinds of things that i've never done the whole animal crossing pokemon thing you know yeah sure and uh i and and i watched a lot of people at minecon participating and they were having fun and I, i like having fun (laughs) <laughs> um so i don't know i'm, I'm a fun loving guy i <laughs> love to play video games exactly uh, yeah well i mean they they put out the 2ds recently which it seems like it's explicitly intended for like okay give this to your six-year-old they can't break it yeah yeah <laughs> um which you know okay maybe that bridges the gap you can get one of those you can play it and you can check some stuff out on it when he's not playing it yeah and so forth uh how like is not having played um I haven't. I played a little bit of Twilight Princess and got bored with it, and haven't played another Zelda game since. How, how do yep. you feel the franchise has kind of been evolving? Is it, or is it still doing kind of the Mario thing where they're taking the same formulas and, and redoing them with slightly, you know, different environments? I mean, it's kind of that, except that I think Mario has actually been way more inventive uh, and and almost experimental comparatively, you know, like Mario galaxy was crazy. (laughs) Yeah. It was like this, you know, you're running around on the surface of planets and flying between them. And it was just like incredibly imaginative. And I haven't played the new one that's on Wii U. Um, but people I know that have played it said it's, you know, it's just as like surprising and they, they keep doing new things that have never been done in Mario before, which is, which is rad. Whereas, yeah, I feel like I don't, I, I hate like, I feel like Zelda has been on just a, a downward trajectory in in the sense of like being hands off and letting the player play the game ever since the very first one, you know, and it's just gotten completely unbearable in the last 10, 15 years where it's just like I, I tried playing Skyward Sword. And it's just like, they won't stop talking. <laughs> like, I don't need to hear anyone say anything to me in Zelda. Like... Nobody talk ever. You yeah, know? it's like yeah. let me let me play Zelda, and, it, and it's so linear, and you spend hours just in the tutorial, and it's just it's literally the opposite of what yeah was attractive about Zelda in the first place. And I think that that's part of what is nice about the the newest one is that like yeah, there is still too much talking. They do need to like be more hands off, but it's better than it has been. And then once you get past that stuff, it really is just like open and and letting the player experience the game is yeah. the the core of, of what you're doing which is great i you know they still need to pull it back and and just say you know okay we're not gonna have anybody say anything unless we absolutely have to and make it all about the gameplay because that's what zelda has been yeah at its best um but you know it, it it's one of those things where it's such a it's such a core franchise it's so important to nintendo that they're making so many of them there's like different teams you know working on different zelda uh, games and so i think you can kind of see different design philosophies between different entries in the series well and that's what i noticed about twilight princess is i was you know i was two hours in and i was i was still going through like the the first like what should have been the 15 minute narrative at the beginning yeah, exactly. And I felt the same way in Skyward Sword. I like played it for hours. And I never got past the point of feeling like, can you just let me play the game? Yeah. You know, like I'm not actually playing the game yet. I'm still advancing through these steps to like, you know, get out of the, the tutorial world. It's like, I don't know. How, how is that? 
I, I, I think that's something that's really important to do is just trust the player to like understand well, how I to think, play the game. I think it's a Japanese thing. That. I think it's a Japanese thing because you look at things like Metal Gear, you know, um, they they've been digging heavy in the you know forced um, narrative. Um, you look at things like like JRPGs and things like that. I, I think that there's a cultural difference going on there that is that is being lost on Americans. But at the same time, like I think it's an evolution of of something that was going on because that wasn't there with the early versions of these games. Yeah, and I think that it's something that um, it all really just depends on the philosophy of the actual you know development studio. Because the other thing that I'm that I'm playing right now um, is I, I restarted a new game of Dark Souls, and Dark Souls is like the game where they don't tutorialize you at all, and they just say like, "Okay, you're playing now," yeah, and they trust you to figure it out, and they make it difficult, and you have to pay attention, and and the everything's communicated through the world and through the mechanics, and you know that is a, a also an extremely Japanese game. So it, I, I think that a big part of it for for like Nintendo, for instance, is okay. We have to sell so many millions of copies, and and we are just kind of paranoid about people not understanding things or getting off on the, the wrong track. And I think it tends to make the experience worse for everybody when when they really try to lock onto that and and just handhold you all the yeah. way through the game. Absolutely agreed. Well, uh, let's let's move on. Yeah. <clears throat> Unless there was another game you want to talk about, is there anything else you want to talk about? Um, I, um, I mean, yeah, it it is weird, kind of playing um, the new Zelda and playing Dark Souls at the same time because, like, Dark Souls is very much it. It feels like somebody who who loved what was originally about Zelda. You know, like it's 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 hard and you have to figure it out yourself and everything compared yeah. to. The actual new new Zelda, which is you know like the the, the classic evolution of of that, um, yeah, and, and kind of being in those those two spaces at the same time is interesting. Uh, you know, I've been playing a little bit of other stuff. You know the you know the IGF at GDC, the Independent Games Festival. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like I'm 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 a judge for that. So I've been Ooh. playing like some interesting uh, indie games and yeah. stuff. You know, um, but that's kind of like a sampling. You know, there's a there, there's so much stuff that uh, goes into that, but. Uh, I've been trying to get my head around. Well, what's um, what's been like a like a big star that you've that you've kind of latched onto a little bit from from those games? Well, I know that um, a lot of people are really excited about um, Papers Please, um, which is like sort of a a a classically uh, IGF centric. You know, it's like it's it's the kind of game that will do really that classically yes. has done really well in IGF, where it's like okay, it kind of has a social message and this kind of narrative that is really deeply intertwined with the mechanics and expressed through how you play and putting you in a, a situation through the design. And also, you know, it's pixel art, which, <laughs> <laughs> you know, people, the, the IGF loves pixel art and yeah. all that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, that, I think that's a game that's been well received broadly, you know, but also it, um, it, it, it kind of, uh, is a, a fit for the IGF. Yeah. Um, do you know the game Eldritch? No. So Eldritch uh, is this game that was made by um, actually somebody. A, f- a few of the games that we've talked about <laughs> are made by people that I used to work with. Uh, I worked with Kent Hudson at Two K Marin. He was a designer on Bioshock Two with me. And um, Eldritch is a game that was made by a one man team, uh, David Pittman, who was a programmer at Two K Marin and worked on Bioshock Two with me. And um, it's like a crazy procedural dungeon crawler roguelike game set in like the Cthulhu mythos and it looks like Minecraft. So <laughs> like you, you, you go through, you start out in this crazy, like gigantic library and then you're going down through the layers of the, the Cthulhu like weird dungeons underneath it. Um, but it's all blocky and it's like a stealth kind of hybrid game, but you can get certain powers that allow you to like destroy and add blocks to be able to, get over walls and get past enemies and stuff like that. And it's a really interesting game. It's a, it's available now. You can go to whatever eldritchgame.com, I think. Um, but I, I, I like that game a lot. Uh, and yeah, it's in the, the IGF too, which is what reminded me. I'm going to have to check that one out because uh, I'm, I'm an old school Cthulhu guy. So yeah. 
and it, it would be the kind of game that's great for streaming because <laughs> it's okay. all you know it's all gameplay you know and it's yeah. it's randomized so you go in and it's always new when you start playing it's surprising okay yeah, check it out excellent eureka ow so probably the big news of this week is that YouTube has started changing how it handles certain things. There are two big changes that happen. The first is that these multi-channel networks like Polaris and Machinima now have two strata of people that uh, have contracts with them. They have affiliates and they have managed partners. Uh, yeah. And basically what's happened is anyone who is on the lower tier, the affiliate now no longer has the instant monetization nor the copyright protection tools that these networks used to give them. Mm. Uh, and this has been a big brouhaha with everybody who's doing Let's Plays on YouTube. But probably yeah. the more insidious thing that's been going on is also due to a recent um, – lawsuit, YouTube has changed the way it's handling its content ID system, and evidently the automation in it has kicked up a notch, and YouTube yeah. Let's Play creators are suddenly being hit with dozens and dozens and dozens of content ID matches, often from people that don't have any association with the product, sometimes with things like interviews in mm. locations, uh, even like, uh, and then people like Blizzard, um, are saying, look, if you're getting any hits from us, we didn't do it. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's, it's kind of been the let's play apocalypse. <laughs> um, yeah, I, we, we got, uh, yeah, we got a contact from, uh, at least one let's player who had gotten a notice on their videos for gone home. And the thing that seems like what's happening, because it was for the, the some music that we had licensed for the game, and so they used it in their video, and then when this new policy came into place, they got an automatic notice about it. Um, and, and they contacted the record label about it, and um, basically what happens is the record label puts all of the you know MP3s of their songs into Google's algorithms, and then YouTube matches the waveform and it's like, oh, I detected that that your song is in this video. And then they automatically send a notice to the to the YouTuber. And what the notice says is just like click this button to acknowledge that you've received this notice that we believe that you have copyrighted content in your video. And then if the record label or whoever wants to actually pursue taking it down that's a totally separate step but as far as the label we work with said yeah it was like they put their back catalog into youtube's you know algorithm and then it just automatically detects that stuff they don't actually manually you know say okay send this guy a notice it's sort of just like a it seems to be more of yeah a notification than saying like okay now your video is taken down. Your right. monetization is automatically disabled. So well, but the that's my understanding. The main problem with this, though, is that when you when you like you lose monetization of this property as soon as this entire process really gets underway. If I'm not mistaken, oh, so so it so it does disable monetization just I, when you get first. Notice? I, I I believe so. Or but the oh, real okay. the real issue is if you if you if the automated if if the process happens, you're also at risk of of getting flagged content. Right. Sure. And once you get strikes against your account because something has been has been content ID matched, and then you dispute it, and they say no, we own that. Um, yeah. It. It, it can really it, it can get your channel shut down. Um, oh, I see. The the real issue here also is that it absolutely has no understanding of fair use. So let's say, right. and Serious Creeper in the chat room brought this up. But like, let's say I'm doing a game review and I want to release it on day one. Yeah. Well, first off, for it to be monetized, for me to make any money off of it, uh, YouTube is now making it sit in the queue for a period of time. Hmm. Whereas before you would be with a managed network and you would have instant monetization. And it was one of the yeah. selling points. And actually, I've kind of known that this change was going to happen for several months now because I, I know a YouTube rep had spoken to somebody I know and said, look, 
what we don't want being part of a network to provide systematic benefits that improve. We don't want other people to be charging to have an improved YouTube experience. Mm. Basic YouTube partners that are not affiliated with a multi-channel network should have the same tools for working within YouTube as some, as a managed network. Okay. Yeah. And I can kind of, I, I can understand that. And originally yeah, sure. I, th I thought that everybody was going to have to go through this period of, of review, but evidently mm -hmm. now that there are these two tiers, there are affiliates, which is what pretty much everybody is going to be that signed on with a multi-channel network. And then there yeah. are these managed partners. The managed partners are still getting the instant monetization. So there is still mm -hmm. this systematic YouTube benefit for signing on with a channel, even though that's kind of what YouTube was hoping to eliminate with this process. I see. Yeah. Um, and if I want to do a GTA five review and include any, you know, content, all of yes. a sudden I can't monetize it. And then if I get a hit on it, I can't make any money off of it until that's resolved. And this is bad. And it's making being a partner, uh, I mean, a, a managed partner in an, in a multi-channel network, um, into more of a systematic benefit than it used to be. Yeah. But it's now yeah, I mean, harder to get. It sounds, it sounds like, yeah, it, it, it sounds like automation that just adds another level of just sort of like headaches to the process. I mean, when you, when you just automatically send notices to people without a human being, being involved, actually, right. that whether it makes sense to, it's just going to cause like tons of edge cases, you know, where it's right. just like, well, this shouldn't have really been sent out in the first place, but now we have to go back on it instead of the opposite side, which is, well, if it doesn't make sense to send it out in the first place, we just won't send it back, send it out. Right. You know, it's like, well, you, you got this erroneous, uh, flag or whatever, and now you have to contest it, which seems to put the onus on the, you know, the YouTuber, the content creator, instead of on the, the actual platform, right. you know, on YouTube itself. Well, and I, and I think there are certain ways that you could do this that would be constructive. I like your idea that, sure, let's flag every, let's, let's toss out a notice to everything that hits. And then if somebody says, no, I have the right to this, then there has to be humans involved. And at that point in time, like I, I put up a, um, E3 two years ago when they, when they announced the Wii U, mm -hmm. um, I did a little video and I, I, I because the, the guy, I can't remember his, got the name who, the guy na name who ran the presser, but he was standing in front of a Chinese symbol on the wall. And mm -hmm. what I did was I made a little video. I called it the Nintendo Translation Network and I changed that Chinese symbol in the, in the picture into various derogatory comments about the Wii U. <laughs> 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 and, <clears throat> And because I put Nintendo in the title, yeah. it got it, it, Nintendo claimed it, mm. and I disputed it because it was a photo of the presser over music that I had that I had purchased that right. was royalty free. And when I disputed it, Nintendo came back and said, "No, that's ours." Mm. And there was nothing I could do. Now, at that point in time, I, I'm okay if there is a flagging system on the content owner side, just like there is on the content creator side. Yeah. So if Nintendo can get in trouble for making false accusations like that, then I won't mind this whole process as much, but they don't. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think it, it creates a really bad scene. Um, I know uh, a lot of people in who have had their who have written specific notification that like letters or videos that they filmed with the creators of the games themselves that yeah. got that got hits and there has to be a system in place for people to defend themselves and if it's not there on the content creator side it's frustrating so yeah well, okay, um, and uh, uh, let's move on from that. I, I think there's going to be more as that develops. I just kind of wanted to let the, the listeners know what was going on with that. Um, yeah. Uh, additionally, I, the VG, the Video Game Awards on 
spike happened this week, and there was a couple of really kind of interesting announcements that caught my eye. First was this uh, game, uh, No Man's Sky. Did you see that trailer? Yeah, I did. Um, and it looks amazing. And it's from the peep. It's from Hello Games, who made Joe Danger. This seemed like a very strange move to them. Um, yeah. And uh, basically, the whole idea is that every planet will be dynamically generated with atmospheres and things like that that are very unique, and it looks beautiful. Yeah, it's true. Did you have you heard anything about this game at all? Uh, I mean, not anything more than you know what's been announced. Um, yeah, you know, it sounds like a procedurally generated planet exploration game um and yeah it looks really interesting um i mean i'm 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 as surprised as you are that that was like the next project from the guys that brought you joe danger you know uh, it's like what really okay um but you know i i i hope that uh i hope that it 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 ends up being as interesting as it looks you know at yeah. this point yeah. um but you know it's it, it is a huge uh, I would imagine very complex undertaking to yes. to handle all of that that stuff. But from um, from a four person you know, team, yeah. Uh, and speaking as someone who made their last game with a four person team, <laughs> I know <laughs> how much bandwidth that gives you. Um, but you know, if, if one of those people is like a procedural generation lord programmer yeah. that uh, just owns that part of it, um, it could it could be really awesome. Yeah. Um, but you know, I I'll, I'll be interested to see what it's like when it when it's actually, you know, playable uh, yeah. by, by, by people outside the studio. The, uh, the next thing that got my attention was Telltale has announced that they're going to be, and they're the ones who did the Walking Dead um, game that was so critically praised. Um, mm -hmm. They're going to be doing a Game of Thrones video game. And I thought this was an excellent decision, mostly because I saw a critique of previous Game of Thrones games that they were all about the warfare and the action. Right. And that's totally not what the story of Game of Thrones is about. Right. It's it's about the intrigue. It's about the characters. It's about backstabbing. And so th I think that this is the first game studio, I think, that has a really good chance of capturing Game of Thrones in something that feels like Game of Thrones. Yeah. I'll be interested to see how they how they handle that just because, like, with Walking Dead, the reason it could be successful because they were like, okay, this is going to be a totally new character with, you know, a set of characters with their own stories that are in the walking dead universe and in the walking dead timeline. But you know, it's not just a retelling of the comics, you know, right. like Lee and Clementine were new creations that, that happened in the same world. And I wonder how you can, I wonder if they're even going to try to do anything like that with the game of Thrones game or whether it's just going to be like, okay, we're, you know, doing the books or, you know, doing the, the TV show again, just you can click through it. And I don't know, but uh, it sounds like a, a different challenge from, yeah, you know, what they, what they signed on for with, with something like The Walking Dead. Yeah. Well, and, and the other troublesome thing is, okay, I want to make a story that's going on in the Game of Thrones world. George R. R. Martin was really thorough. <laughs> yeah. We pretty right. much know what's going on with every character we <laughs> care about um, yep. at all points in time. So I don't know where they might be able to sneak in some major plot in that story that doesn't directly tie into something that's already been written about. I don't know. We'll yeah, see. Yeah. Yep. Uh, the last thing I kind of wanted to talk about, I, and uh, by the way, I, is that elder scrolls online has been announced for April 4th, which kind of mm. surprises me because they just did like a batch of closed betas and that's four months away. They're, they're going to have like a really short open beta, I assume. Um, yeah. And I participated in the latest um, closed beta and mm. found, and I, I, for those who don't listen to the show very often, I am MMO'd out. I love the <laughs> concept of MMOs, but basically <clears throat> I feel like MMOs are this really long slog to get you to the part of the game that you want to play. Yeah. And for the most part, I don't have that, you know, 160 hour time commitment to get to level cap so I can feel like I'm actually participating in the world. Right. Yeah. However, with Elder Scrolls, I knew the lore 
and the environment enough to feel more intimate with that early leveling system. Mm, yeah. And I think I'm going to admit that good lore can fix an MMO and the basic problems with the structure of an MMO. <laughs> that is a, that is a big claim. <laughs> um, I, I have like, I've, I've, I've been wanting to play the secret world ever since it came out and I've owned yeah. it for a while and I haven't played it. And it's because I, I'm tired of MMOs and I'm tired of that slog right. and I'm tired of starting zones and I'm tired of, I'm tired of like not having a direction for my character for the first 20 levels and feel like I'm not going to get the powers I want until, you know, 60, 60 minutes or 60 hours into the game. Yeah. But, and, and I did find some of the combat in elder scrolls online a little tedious um, at times, but at the same time, like I found myself, interested again and i'm almost a little mad at myself <laughs> I, i'm not sure i'm going to get into this but i don't know if i'm going to be able to help it with having gone back and playing dragonborn recently and taking interest in the in the environment i'm not i'm not sure i can let it go i might have to pick it up <laughs> yeah it'll be interesting to see because i mean like it feels like the the era of subscription-based mmos has passed to me, you know, like I, yeah. I don't, I, I never, I didn't feel like for instance, you know, Bioware's star Wars MMO really ever got off the ground. You know, they like made it free to play really soon. I think after it came out and stuff and like, I may, you know, Bethesda, uh, seems to, you know, have a golden touch with the, uh, with elder scroll stuff and with fallout, like, you know, um, and so maybe it'll, maybe it'll be a, a big hit for them. Um, but it, it's it feel you know like I, I think that I think what you described about MMOs is how a lot of people feel. I mean, I know I have never really gotten into an MMO for an extended period of time. Like I would play for like a month, you know, and then just get bored of it. And it seems like something that everybody's played, you know. So yeah. I I wonder what the big differentiation is um, for something like Elder Scrolls Online, aside from lore. Yeah. <laughs> lore is not is not like a draw for me personally. So it's like. And yeah, I why, why and I don't know rest? I don't know how it did it, but I I I was <laughs> something about it felt familiar enough and yet different enough for me to appreciate it, and that's a really tough statement for me to make um, yeah. because, like I said, I've I've been railing against the whole concept of MMOs lately, as mm -hmm. even though like there was a time I used to go on the Gamers with Jobs conference call periodically. I don't know if you know that mm -hmm. that podcast yeah. at all. Yeah, yeah, um, sure. I was a guest on there a couple of times and they always tried to drag me in to talk about MMOs because they didn't play MMOs very much. I used to be the MMO guy for them. Mm, and and now yeah. I'm like, MMO. So. <laughs> Inspiration. So now that you've had this successful experience developing a game and you've gotten all this critical review, I'm going to ask you the typical question everybody asks, what's next? What are you doing next? I mean, we don't know yet, <laughs> which is which is nice because we don't have to know yet. You know, it's like we 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 put a year and a half into making this game, and um, you know, but we came right off of our jobs, you know, working in in on big AAA titles before that. Um, and at this point, you know, we're just trying to basically take a break for a little while, at least long enough to be able to get some distance from Gone Home and to really be able to you know, ha have the time to, to really know what we're getting into when we start building our next thing, which, you know, it'll be sometime next year that we'll start working on, on our next thing. But, um, I think it's really valuable to be able to, you know, get, get out of the headspace of the last thing that you made before you start working on something else. If you have that luxury, you know, um, but you know, we, we, we want to, um, take on home as a base, you know, and, and, um, figure out how to explore further from what we did with, with gone home and make a new interesting experience that stands on its own and is different. and isn't just more of the same, but that also, you know, takes what we've done, um, and, and, and takes advantage of the work that we put into that and, and puts a new kind of angle on her and you twist on it and, um, 
makes it into a, a game that feels like a totally unique creation um which you know that's a that's a that's a line to walk that has its own challenges but it at least means that we're not throwing everything out and starting over and we're not just saying okay it's gone home but in a in a different house you know just like <laughs> oh it's gone home with different stuff in it you know well um, and i was actually going to recommend that would you would you please ponder making april fools dlc i would love <laughs> to see gone home the garden shed and and gone home multiplayer i think that would be hilarious and i think you should ponder it for an april fools release I think on home multiplayer would actually be legitimately fun. <laughs> 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 you can throw physics objects at each other. Uh, no, it'd be good. Uh, so, um, how like who did you work with before you you went indie? Uh, I worked on Bioshock Infinite and Bioshock Two, um, and I was the lead on the Minerva Stand DLC for for Bioshock Two. That's where um, me and the other two co-founders of the Fulbright Company met each other. We worked together on uh, on Bioshock Two, Two Team Room, and and have I know, I I ask this question all the time. Like, was was there anything where all of a sudden you went, "We're going indie"? How how, <laughs> how have you how how does that even come up? How do you even ponder that when you're working for, you know, one of the most you know critically acclaimed companies around? Well, you know, it's one of those things where I, I worked at 2K Marine for like two and a half, three years. Um, you know, and I, 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 I was there early for Bioshock 2 and I shipped that game and then went straight into the DLC for that and then went straight from that and moved out to Boston to work on Bioshock Infinite. You know, and I worked on that for a year. And at the end of that experience, you know, I was just sort of like, all right, I've I've worked on these, you know, I've worked on these big games, and the, the game that you know, working on Infinite was was bigger than any of the games I've worked on before that, because you know, it doesn't get a whole lot bigger than that as far as the AAA industry goes. Um, and you know, by the by the end of that, it was just sort of like of my my year there. I was just, you know, my wife and I were like, okay, you know, we 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 don't really want to be in Boston in the long term, you know, like we Rachel, my wife, is from. Portland, Oregon, where we live now. And I had lived there for a long time. We both kind of wanted to get back there. And I just, you know, I, I, I didn't want to work on big, huge projects anymore. You know, like I, I had gone from working on Bio 2, which was like 80 or 100 people, to working on the, the DLC, which was only 12 people full time on that project, to going back to working on, you know, Infinite that had like 150 people on it you know and i was you know I, I think i was just like i want to get back to working on that smaller scale um and my wife and i want to move back to you know where we want to end up which is which is portland so you know we we're just like all right it's been a great year and i've learned a ton and and i've contributed stuff i'm proud of to to bioshock infinite and we just need to get back to to where we want to be, you know, move back to the, to the West coast. And so at that point it was like, all right, well, if we made the decision to move back, if it was primarily just based on, okay, well, you know, just a life decision kind of thing, like where we wanted to, to live, then how can I keep making video games? Uh, <laughs> Cause there isn't really a big established industry in Portland, you know, like there's a little bit of stuff going on, but it's not like I could just apply for a level designer job here. And so that, you know, that's when I started thinking about, well, if we could do an indie thing, like who have I worked with before that might want to, you know, throw in and, and start this studio um, and, and make a game. And, you know, that's when I started talking to Carla and, and Yonaman about, you know, what we what we might be able to do. Was there was there a complication with starting the studio you didn't predict? Like, it, was there something that when you went in, you're like, OK, we've got this. And then all of a sudden you went, whoa, wait a minute. <laughs> um, well, I mean, that, probably the biggest thing. And it resolved itself quickly, which is great. But, you know, it was the three of us started the, the company and we're, you know, a writer slash designer, a 2D artist and a programmer. But we just, you know, we had worked on these first person games, you know, so we were like, okay, we're going to make this immersive first person exploration experience, which means that you're going to need a lot of 3D art. And we didn't have a 3D artist, you know, so like we, we, we just kind of started with the assumption like, oh, we'll just like, buy buy models online or like contract people piecemeal or or whatever yeah um but it really quickly became clear that that was not going to be viable you know if we wanted the game to actually like look good and feel cohesive and everything but really luckily for us we met our fourth 
full-time team member, uh, Kate Craig, just a couple months after we started on the game. And she's an amazing 3D artist, environment artist. And we were able to say, like, hey, we're, we, you know, we started working on this thing. We have a very early version of it playable. We could really use a 3D artist. Would you want to you know, also quit your job and, and work on our <laughs> game instead? Uh, and she, she's from Canada. She's from, uh, she lived in Vancouver, BC at the time. And she worked remotely for us full time on the game and did all the, the 3D art in the game. Um, but, you know, we didn't know that was going to pan out when we started. But I'm really glad. I think it's super important that we did start making the game before we knew where that last really important piece was going to come from because otherwise we might have never made it you know because it's like yeah. oh well we don't have this fourth really important person so we can't even start you know and i think that it's it's way more valuable that we said okay we have enough to start with and we'll figure out the rest and that's really the only reason that they gone home got made well, and I, I can imagine like getting getting such critical acclaim right off the bat. I mean, you know, there's few people that get that in in the indie environment. There's a lot of indie games that come out, and and you guys have been really blessed. Um, I, I know that like um, I don't know if you ever saw that report that the guys who made Swap Force made, um, where they showed sales and the mm -hmm. spikes in sales. Have have uh, you guys have probably had a much more smooth curve on that based on the style of the game and the positive reviews are you noticing those peaks of sales around certain things yeah yeah definitely i mean i think that that's something that you know if you if you're you know fortunate enough to be able to be in like steam steam sales you know that, that uh feature you on the steam front page and stuff like that you definitely get really big spikes you know of, of just just due to awareness you know people mm -hmm. are like oh that game uh, you know, and it's half off or whatever, so I'll buy it, and it's it's huge. Um, yeah, and and we've been lucky, especially like at the end of this year. You know, we've been on gift guides and end of year lists and stuff. So our just like normal day to day sales are stronger than they have been between discounts in the past. But it's definitely very much like you know, at launch people buy the game and then it flattens out, and then you put it on sale and people buy the game. You know, and 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 then it flattens back out when it's full price because people definitely, I think, wait for sales um, in a lot of cases on Steam. But like, you know, that's great because it just means that if you start, you know, we started at a fairly high retail price just as far as, you know, we started at 20 bucks. And a lot of people, you know, they're just like, oh, I don't want to buy a short game for that much. So I'll just wait for a sale. And so then when it's 10 bucks instead, okay, now it's within, you know, the price range for those people that didn't want to buy it for full price. And then when it's like, five dollars on a flash sale now you get more people that are up for it and it kind of just gives i feel like everybody an opportunity to grab the game when it's at a, a price that that they're happy with um and it's good for the for the developers as well how uh, like what what's the decision process make that, that you make before you say okay it's time to humble bundle it like is there <laughs> is there a is there a marker that you wanted to put in your head before you did that i mean did you think about that at any point in time I mean, it's it's just one of those things where it's like every time you discount the game, more people are gonna gonna buy it, right? Which means that if you if you put the game in the humble bundle and you say you can pay whatever you want for this, then everybody who buys it, you know, for a dollar or whatever, they will have already bought it. If you were to put it on discount for, you know, like two bucks after that it's like well a ton of those people that would have bought it for two bucks have already bought it for pay what you want yeah. so you know like it's i think it's just a it's a fairly it's becoming a fairly standard practice of like okay you know you 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 do it 33 percent off then 50 percent off then 66 then 75 then 85 and then the game's been out for a year and you've kind of stepped the the discounts up to the point where okay your game's been on sale for like 250 for a week and so everybody who is is up for buying it at like a set price has had their chance and yeah. so now okay a couple months later you put it in humble bundle and then the people who are really holding out for i don't want to buy this until it's pay what you want then they they have their shot you know but it's like if you were to do a, a 75 percent discount and then do a 50 percent discount it's like well okay people that would have bought it at 50 have already bought it for less. So, you know, it, yeah. I think it's a pretty straightforward thing of just gradually 
being like, okay, here's a even lower price. Are you up for that? Here's an even lower price. Are you up for that? Here's the lowest price we're ever going to ask for it. If you're not up for that, fine. Here, just like <laughs> just play with the bundle with ten other games, you know, kind of yeah. thing. But if you do it out of order, I think that you're just sort of like cannibalizing sales that you might have made at a at a higher price point. That's just like within some people's comfort zones and not others, you know. I I'd be also be interested to see like I'm sure that Humble has worked with Steam to see if there's any residual Steam sales that come after the you know like after somebody gets it on the Humble bundle and plays mm-hmm. it and then talks to their friends about it. There's got to be some residual steel, Steam sales there that yeah. happen afterwards. Yeah. I, I I don't know. I think there's some interesting stuff there. Well, we've been going. We yeah. have been going almost an hour, and I know you have an event to get to, so um, we can wind down. Is there anything that you've got coming up in the immediate future that you want to let the listeners know about? Um, I, I mean, uh, let's see. I, I don't know. Uh, we're 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 trying to chill it out, <laughs> so there's not any big announcements coming up or anything. Um, but you know, keep an eye out because yeah, we're coming up on the holidays, so there's going to be some discounts and stuff. And if you haven't gotten a chance to play gone home yet uh you you might have your your shot in the next uh, few weeks uh oh and one other thing i wanted to ask like um the i i i'm sure that the nostalgia elements in gone home are intimately tied to your personal experiences um sure. have it, uh, do you think like um how much of your sales do you think is from tapping into that or do you think that was just sort of like, cause I, I didn't really have any exposure to the, you know, to the uh, indie punk scene in the mid nineties. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Do you, so like my experience was completely tangential on that, that whole thought process. Like, have you had people that have pursued it just because of that illusion? Uh, I think that like we've had, we, we have had some ability to kind of reach outside of our core audience via that stuff, you know, where it's like, Oh, we got this music and that makes it, you know, the, the riot girl music that's in the game makes the game itself interesting to this part of the audience that might not have ever even heard about it in the first place. Um, and that's, that's cool. Like we're glad that that can be part of, um, what the game can, can offer. But on the other hand, I think that, you know, I think that's relatively small and I think it's great to have more exposure that way. But I think the, you know, like, the nostalgia of the nineties stuff, the, you know, the, the VHS tapes and everything. Like, I think those are something that, that, you know, when people play the game and have that, that spark of recognition, it maybe gives them another reason to like recommend it to their friends or whatever. Right, but, right. um, I think the biggest thing is just, you know, people being like, I played this thing and it was really interesting to, to discover the story. And it's an experience that, you know, you should have and, and tell their friends, like, I don't want to tell you too much about it. You should just play it. You know, I yeah. think that's our, our biggest selling. Okay. Well, Steve, thank you very much for coming on the show. I'm sorry. My friend Spencer couldn't, couldn't join in and talk with you some, um, yeah, but, but it was a real pleasure. I, I love interacting with people who actually think a lot about games and, and you seem to be, quite the thinker about stuff so i (laughs) i i I, when i created the show i kind of wanted it to be a little um nerdy intellectual haven for yeah for for the for thoughts about game concepts and so i appreciate you joining us no thanks for having me on i'm glad we could finally catch up Uh, it's been a lot of fun Okay. And uh, everybody, I'll try to have the show up this week. Uh, you can always find them on YouTube at Core Elements Show, and, or you can go to coreelementsshow.com and get the show notes and links to other episodes. And thank you very much for joining us, and uh, take care. As one final note, Steve has agreed to give us some Gone Home keys to give away. And if you would like to receive a copy of Gone Gone Home, just go to our website, coreelementsshow.com, and scroll over to the Contact Us section. You'll see a phone number there for leaving a voicemail. Call and leave us a voicemail at 256-763-0455. Let us know what you think about the show. Let us know a guest you'd like to have in the future. Um, Or just say hi, I love what you're doing. Anyway, uh, give us a call and three of the people who leave us voicemails will get a copy of Gone Home. So, like I said, give us a call, 256-763-0455. You've been listening to Core Elements, exploring gaming one element at a time, a listener-supported podcast. 
See the show notes or get more information at corelementshow.com or leave us a voicemail at 256-763-0455.